Ice Squitch Hill, uh, Tamsin at Snat. Uh, hello, good morning. Uh, my name is Tam Lutz. I'm a member of the Lummi Nation, and I'll be the facilitator for today. I'm the MCH Programs Director at the Northwest Portland Area Indian Health Board. Uh, welcome to our third Maternal Child Health Echo. Um, we have a full schedule today. Let me introduce our faculty. Um, we have uh, uh, Dr. Um, Allison Empey. Uh, she's a pediatrician um, at both OHSU and at Grand Ron. I'm going off the top of my head here, Allison. So <laughs> um, um, she was born and raised in McMinnville as a Grand Ron tribal member. Yes. Um, and um, is excited to be here. And um, we also have Dawn Ray Bankston, and she has been a pediatric nurse for over 23 years. And Dawn has worked in public health, migrant health, and with uh, tribal clinics. And she joined the Northwest Portland Area Indian Health Board just recently through a grant through the CDC Foundation uh, uh, in a public health role. Uh, in addition, we have Carrie Lopez, and she's Talawa, Talawa tribal member. She's the project director for the Western Tribal Diabetes and Northwest Tribal Comprehensive Cancer Projects. And she's worked in tribal health for over 20 years, and she carries a lot of experience in program management, diabetes, tobacco, um, breast and cervical cancer, has provided a lot of training and technical assistance to tribes as well as policy, education, tobacco cessation, um, providing an overall history of Indian health. Uh, so um, we have guests here today from Namimipu Health, um, Valerie Albert and um, Julie Keller, who will be providing our case for today. Okay, Candice, you wanna pull up the presentation for Carrie? And just to remind folks again that Car um, um, that Carrie uh, is Carrie Lopez, and she is has been here at the board for I think well over twenty years as the director of our um, diabetes and cancer control program. Take it away, Carrie. All right. Good afternoon, um, and I want to just do a couple. Um, upfront disclaimers. I am not a doctor. I am not a nurse, but I have a lot of experience with tobacco prevention and cessation. Um, my personal confession, I was a smoker. I loved smoking. <laughs> um, I understand the challenges. The first time I quit for a long period of time was when I had my uh, first baby 35 years ago. Um, and I started smoking again and after he was born, but I, I snuck it. So I really feel like I understand the struggles and um, it, it is a very, very hard thing to quit. And I know not everybody liked it, but I did. It, it's, I, thought it was, <laughs> I thought it was really fun. <laughs> I love smoke and I haven't smoked for a very long time. Um, so I really am gonna address commercial tobacco. Um, I've been working in this field, like I said, for almost 25 years. I have seen some tremendous progress and we still have a long way to go. Next slide, please. So I, I just wanna make the note we care because we know our children are our future. Um, we know breastfeeding is important. We know it is the first original traditional food. And like I said in the beginning, we have huge disparities in our smoking rates for not only pregnant women, but our entire population. And just a little side note, that is my daughter and my granddaughter there in that picture where they did some promo for the uh, Indian Health Board. Next, please. And as I said earlier, and I didn't want to make a big deal about <laughs> the liking smoking, but what the heck, the, the reason nicotine is so highly addictive and so hard to stop is that it is an incredible drug. So when you think about when you take that hit off of your cigarette, it takes about five to seven seconds for that jolt to hit your brain where you get that rush. 
But then the other beautiful thing about nicotine is it's also a relaxant, so it's a dopamine. So you've got this dual drug that has tremendous power. Um, so I really feel like part of our, um, what we need to change and how we address tobacco, and it came up in the case and I really loved it, is that we really need to stop addressing it as a stigma. It needs to be addressed as a chronic disease, just like any other chronic disease in our community. And I think once we start doing that, hopefully we're gonna see some changes. The worst thing you can do with smokers is try and shame them. So um, I really loved that. You talked about that in the case study that that's not at all what happened with trying to get your young lady to stop smoking. Next please. So why is it a concern? And this was one of the better slides that I found, and this is looking at um, the Child Trends Data Bank. And you can see American Indians, we're the 18% there. We have the highest rate of smoking during pregnancy. But um, the other thing, and I didn't put this on a slide and I apologize, but in reality, when you look at Oregon data, our pregnant women smoke 33% times more. When you look at CDC data, their data says 24%. When you look at, um, and I just randomly was, searching in North Carolina. The rate for American Indian Alaska Native pregnant women is 33 and in California it's 34. So we really have a ways to go in one of our studies done at the board and I didn't cite it because we're still working on it. We even found that our, our pregnant women in Oregon take up smoking in their second trimester of pregnancy. So we have high rates not only in the first trimester but higher in the second trimester um, anecdotally, I'm going to say it's probably that it's the stress and you're trying to stop smoking. And when you have other things going on, it's, it's, it's got that dopamine effect. Next, please. So when we look at, again, when we look at our babies and when we look at what's happening in our communities, we really want to stop smoking cessation early in the pregnancy if we can. Um, part of that is that When you look at, and, and I'm gonna present this later, but Allison alluded to the sooner they stop, the better. And the less cigarettes they smoke, the better because of what they're getting in the nicotine. But hopefully we can stop them early in their pregnancies. Next, please. I forgot to stop my timer. So you, you all know this, you all work out there in the community, but this is my slide that is, this is risk factors connected, um, not causes, but connected. So when you go down this list and you look at the issues in our communities and the risks of our babies and our kids, um, sudden infant death, we have higher rates, colic. And Maddie was getting at this with her question, asthma, bronchitis, pneumonia, ear infections. Those are all tied to secondhand smoke and smoking. Um, childhood obesity, I'm not gonna, I don't wanna read the list to you, but I do because I just wanna reiterate what we're dealing with here. And sometimes I think tobacco doesn't come up as a big issue, but for our babies and our communities, it really is. So there's a lot of things, um, attention deficit, brain abnormalities. And then of course, when you're smoking, your heart rate's going up. So oxygen and carbon monoxide is, is a, causes respiratory problems. And that's another little board baby over there. That's um, Ryan's little girl, Priscilla, who did have some issues when she was born. So that made it near and dear to our hearts too to do this presentation. Next, please. So here was I, what I was talking about with the birth weights. So the more the baby, the more the mom smokes through the trimesters, the more at risk. So in the first trimester, if you can get them to stop, there's really, um, as far as birth weight, pretty normal. If you can stop them before the second trimester. Second trimester, they're, they're born with a, a shorter femur and we have all those basketball players and athletes out there, so we don't want that. And then the third trimester, it's actually a lower birth rate and it affects the head circumference of the baby. And then that dose that we're talking about is there at the bottom of the actual impact it has on the weight with the babies. So as you can see, the more um, a mom smokes, the less the baby's gonna weigh. Next, please. And also with breastfeeding, it's the same thing when you think about earlier when I said when you take that hit from your cigarette, um, this, the nicotine also is in your breast milk. So again, your 
feeding your baby, um, I don't want to say problems, but they are problems because it can cause colic, um, thyroid dysfunction, vomiting and diarrhea, the increased heart rate because, of, again, the mom's heart rate's going up. It can decrease your supply of breast milk um, and even waiting. And I know this is a tough one and it sounds kind of weird, but if you wait 90 minutes after you smoke, you're actually even better off because some of the nicotine's gone from your body. The other thing I'm going to add here is um, even if the mom doesn't smoke, if their partners are smoking, it can have the same impact where they're breathing in the secondhand smoke. So even if the mom isn't feeding, if there's a lot of smoking going on in the household or with partners or um, in houses with brothers, sisters, it's important to try and maybe um, not smoke. So that's a tough one, I know. And I know early on, one of the issues was even like, if you can go outside and smoke and wear the same coat and leave the coat out on the porch when you come back in and not bring the secondhand and thirdhand smoke back into the house. That's even a tactic. So we're looking at the whole family here. Next, please. Ah. And then SIDS. Um, I talked a little bit about the rates being higher. And I'm actually sorry, I totally didn't even think about finding those and I know they're available. So I might try and find them and get them posted with the resources. But SIDS with parents who smoke, um, we have higher rates. So the hit, when you look at um, being exposed to secondhand smoke, when they do, oh, I hate to use this, but when babies die from SIDS, they have higher concentrations of nicotine and cotinine in their, in their blood. And that's from secondhand smoke. And I'll talk a little bit about cotinine toward the end. Next, please. Um, and I'm going to switch over to treatment because I really think that's where we want to go with this. And I think it's important when we talk about tobacco cessation and when we're trying to help our patients stop smoking, we're not curing tobacco dependence. We're just trying to help the patient stop smoking. So when you look at all of those um, nicotine replacement therapies and gum and patches, they're giving you that dose hit of nicotine to help you get off of tobacco you still are getting a little bit of nicotine. And I think that's important to know. Um, the other thing, and there's a lot of research currently around pregnant women and their nicotine doses out of OHSU, but pregnant women need more nicotine replacement there, nicotine replacement drugs because you're pregnant. And then the other thing with women is um, we absorb the nicotine differently. And there are reasons for that. And I'm gonna talk about that in a little bit also. Um, next, please. So you can be uh, prescribed nicotine replacement or you can get it over the counter. So I just want, kind of wanted to make that difference known because you can go buy patches, gums um, at the drugstore, but what we really want our women to do and our, in our communities is for the um, smokers to work with our tribal clinics and they have to, to get the prescriptions. But again, I think in the case study, how that was presented, it's so important that the healthcare team is part of it. Um, but if they are trying to stop and they want to go get patches, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to stop that. So I just want to say there are, are over the counter stuff that um, folks can go and buy. Next please. So I wanted to put a little bit in on marijuana and pregnancy. And again, it's just not a good idea. Um, the, the babies, again, are born underweight, prematurely, have smaller heads. It's the same kind of outcome as when you're smoking tobacco. Um, so just not a good idea to, to smoke marijuana during preg pregnancy, or even the, the oil is not good for our pregnant women. Next, please. Um, so again, the chemicals can be passed to the breast milk. So we're talking pregnancy. And again, I'm shifting over to when the baby's born. Again, the um, CBD gets passed through the breast milk. And it's, comp it, it's harder because it gets stored in your body fat. So actually, it's there a long time. So it's released over time and a longer period of time. 
So again, just don't do it. Next, please. And COVID's already been talked about, but I really just wanted to include it because it's just not a good idea right now. It's, it complicates your respiratory issues. Um, smoking is horrible for your respiratory. So the other uh, thing is that pregnant women have been put into the uh, risk group for COVID and smoking. So just, we just don't want our pregnant women. We don't want them smoking and certainly the COVID complicates things. So, um, we want them to stop smoking. COVID and the symptoms may therefore be severe if you smoke. Next, please. And that's what I thought was coming up next. So again, the intervention successes, I think what's really important is we know that just one style of intervention is not as effective. So again, I have that opening thing there about how addictive nicotine is and how complex. So it's not only biological, it's environment, environmental and psychological. So a single intervention is less effective. And when I say a single intervention, it's like um, a lot of people decide to stop cold turkey, that's awesome. But when you combine that with any other treatment, including counseling, the quit line, um, sending out or referrals, like it doubles the likelihood that the person's going to stop smoking. So um, we just need to know that, that it, it's, it's, a, it's a bigger picture. It's a community picture. It involves the family, the clinic, the person. So I think we, we illustrated that with the case that that is really going to help her, I hope. Um, this last one, where it says relapse is normal and expected. I know we say that, but I like to just say, I don't, I don't know if I like the word relapse, but it's like you slipped, we're gonna get going again. Um, I think there's an average out there that it takes seven to 11 times to stop smoking, but we want them to stop the first time if they can, and we wanna give all the support they can. I'm gonna confess that I think I stopped five times, um, twice when I was pregnant. So um, it is a hard process and we wanna give support. Next, please. And I wanted to talk, there are some curriculums and resources out there. I don't know how much clinics want to invest, but some of them are a little old, but there's a couple of native specific ones. The Second Wind, First Breath is um, a curriculum that was done, I think, in about 2008. And there it was two native women, LaDonna Blue Eyes. Um, it's a good curriculum. It's a good outline. And then it's based on the second wind curriculum that we have done trainings for at the Indian Health Board. That's a native specific curriculum also. And that curriculum is a little more um, geared for if you have someone who's gonna do a group with your women or do one-on-one -on -one counseling and meet with them in kind of a class type setting. Whereas, I'll go back to script, but the, the American Indian Alaska Native Basic Tobacco Intervention Skills, and that's the one out of the University of Arizona is very clinical focused. So that intervention is really talking, using the five A's, but it's really talking about doing cessation in, in your clinical setting. So that's kind of the difference between the second wind and the um, tobacco intervention skills. The script is a curriculum out of Alaska. It's a little bit old too, but it is, um, it is definitely geared to pregnant women. And then I just added, um, I, I found a diabetes and tobacco cessation curriculum that I just thought was really, really good. So I have that um, curriculum on hand. And then I put our project on the bottom because really if you're interested in, in curriculum resources and training, we can guide you to some really good trainings and we provide some really good trainings. So I just put the Northwest Tribal Comprehensive Cancer Project there on the bottom and we do, um, have our contact information at the end. And I have Maddie Palmatier and Chandra Wilson are both on the call today. They work in my projects and would be also great resources. I throw in little tidbits. That picture is my um, grandmother. And that's a, that's a picture that was taken of her when she was 18 by, um, oh my gosh. I'm talking, I, when I talk this much, I, 
Thank you. It's a Curtis photo. So um, I just love that photo. I like to put it in. It's my, my family tie to trying to stay healthy and safe. Next, please. So I talked a little bit about codeine earlier, and that's what gets measured in your blood. And the codeine levels really tell you how much um, nicotine's there. So it's absorbed through the body and metabolized. And I have that little CDC fact sheet on the bottom because if you're interested in more, there is a really good fact sheet. But I said earlier that often when we look at research in our own communities, I think it's like, okay, we know all this stuff, um, but how has it impacted Indian countries? So there's a woman named Christy Patton who worked out of Mayo Clinic and she worked with the Native American um, group there at Mayo with, uh, she's not there anymore, but her, she did in Alaska with Alaska Native women and pregnant women and even secondhand smoke. So there, there, are, there are studies that we know are there. Um, I know for Alaska, it was really a, a challenge. Their smoking rates were more like 50 and 60%. So Christy was up there for a long time working with Alaska Native women and gained their trust and was able to do a lot of good research. So if you're interested in the codeine, I put that fact sheet reference at the bottom because I think it's, I think it's interesting. So please. And again, I talked a little bit about, how, about uh, metabolizing it. So um, during pregnancy, women, um, are, are, are um, absorbing codeine quicker. So next slide, please. And the other point I really, really wanted to make was um, that, oh, this is just talking a little bit about the study. One more, please. And those are just numbers, but this is the point I'm trying to make. So women in the end um, do absorb codeine at a higher level and their part of it is uh, birth control and hormones, but we do know that we're absorbing it quicker. And in the last 10 years, we've seen an increase in women's lung cancer. So men are still at a higher rate, but women are, are getting it quicker in the last 10 years. Uh, next slide. And this is, Oh, no, my final. This is, I'm switching gears because I'm talking about studies a little bit here, but this is a study that came out of OHSU. And it's, I would never say, let's keep our women smoking and get, a, get them, give them vitamin C. But basically there was a long-term study with pregnant moms and we, they found out that vitamin C can actually um, supplement, if you supplement it with pregnant women smokers, there are better outcomes with pulmonary function. So I think it's just something that's gonna get out there more, but it's pretty new from OHSU. Um, partly from one of our docs we work with a lot, Dr. David Gonzalez. So um, I know David has a lot of information on women and smoking also. And next slide, please. And then I'm gonna take another switch because I think we've talked a lot about um, the case study about the dangers, but the reality is in our communities, we have power to make change. Um, we have power to take things to our community and to our tribal governing bodies. So look overall, tribal policies can be really, really powerful in helping with secondhand smoke and thirdhand smoke. So tribal free, um, smoke free tribal housing and again, even when you look at that, like in our housing, the insurance would go down if we didn't smoke, but even how smoke stays on the walls, like that, that impacts our babies and our kids. So uh, smoke-free school campus, which sounds bizarre, but we still have, yeah, most of them are smoke-free. Um, and then just restrictions. Uh, again, I talked a little bit about um, we don't want to make it so we're judging and we don't want to make the smokers the bad people. Um, we want to address helping our community and our tribal members stop smoking or at least give them information to support their families. Next, please. 
And I think the takeaways, um, I, I love the case because it's saying here that we need to treat the whole family and not just the mom, um, that multiple cessation modalities work the best, be it um, counseling and nicotine replacement and classes. Um, the, the tribal community policies are incredible. And then the health education materials that will help um, people understand. So as part of, um, and I, I, don't, I didn't have them to put up on the screen, but I have prov provided several fact sheets that, that my staff has put together. I think they give kind of that basic takeaway message. There's one on breastfeeding. There's a fact sheet on environmental tobacco smoke. There's a fact sheet on um, e-cigarettes. So I really hope that you guys take a look at those. They're a little more community friendly. Um, I love this topic. I wanna say that I have had the privilege um, to see some change in our community. I think we've seen policy implemented. Um, we've seen breastfeeding permit. We've seen um, kind of a, a broader picture of health, but we have a long ways to go. So I wanna say thank you for your time. And next, I think that's it. Yeah, and I think we can open oh. up for questions. You did a great job of timing that, Terry, Carrie. I did want to say hot off the press. Oh, shoot, this is not. OK, um, these are all the quit lines, but I just got a message today from Washington State that they actually have a, a phone app for pregnant women. So if you go to their quit line and then go to smoke and tobacco, It'll, you can sign up for the pregnant women's app. So I thought that was kind of interesting. I just got it today. Whew, I have a sore throat. Right. And there are other, the resources that Carrie provided um, are also on the MCH Echo page on Indian Country Echo. I put the, the link in the chat. Uh, it will have both uh, the resources, some of the resources she's talked about, um, as well as the slides that she presented to, today and her, a video of the presentation once that gets edited because we don't we don't put up video of the case presentation but we do of the actual um, didactic. Do we have questions from folks for Carrie? Carrie, there's... oh, I'm sorry. It's no, the... <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I just wanted to ask you, you talked about the study around pregnant women and vitamin C and, and uh, improved pulmonary outcomes. Where was that study done? Do you know? It was at OHSU and it is listed on the on the resource list. It's really pretty new. I think it's it's been out for about a year because when we first did this, they had just done the study and then it was released. And what's OHS do you say? Oh, sorry, or Oregon Health Science University. Okay, thank you. Do we have other questions for Carrie or Allison or the folks from Namimibu? Uh, um, thank you so much, Carrie. It was a wonderful presentation. I have a question regarding the partner smoking and you mentioned it very briefly at the end. Has this study um, controlled for like, you know, you mentioned some species like smoking outside, having an extra coat. Has all of these studies that you mentioned, like does that have any effect on like the baby's uh, outcome as well? If like they are taking like that, the partner takes that many precautions about like leaving the coat outside or washing hands and all that, or uh, there's no information about that or no study regarding that to separate <laughs> participants in terms of how they mm. did it, you know? Not that I know of. Um, the studies I was talking about, because they were specifically, especially done in Alaska, I think they found it challenging and they were just, well, anywhere, like they're just trying to get the smoke outside. So I think those were like common sense strategies that were put out there. I, I don't know of any studies where they studied a household who did it and a household who did not. 
I, I think partly because like these are all risk factors, so it makes it hard. But again, I mean, when I, I worked at NARA for five, four or five years when I left working at the amount of um, earaches and asthma and everything that we saw that was related to secondhand smoke. And, and I mean, it's anecdotal because we didn't do a research study, but it was very real. Yeah, thank you so much. Also like one last question that I have, it's, I'm not familiar with the research on this area, but it's, it's really hard to wonder like how, like how well this study is really controlled for all of the demographics and covariates that really affects child's outcome as well as a smoking, you know, is this like, are these like really well controlled to make sure that, you know, it's not the stress or like the SES or other factors that might be very relevant in a smoker's life that you know, affects child's outcome. So I'm not familiar with this line of research, but it's always like something that comes in mind, you know, how well they, um, like where they like really controlled, randomized, you know, like controlled study or. Okay, I'm done with the question, but thank you so much also for like sharing your personal journey. It was very um, nice. That and I love like the fact that you mentioned like not stigmatizing, you know, like the people who are smokers and like that has a lot of effects in the maybe the efficacy of like the treatment. Yeah, and I've been working in tobacco a long time. I actually really feel like partly what happened for us in our communities like 20 years ago when um, they called it a paradigm shift in tobacco when we went to really looking at incorporating policy and behavior change at the community level. Um, and I do believe that works, but I think what happened is the rest of the population had had the opportunity to be in tobacco cessation classes and one-on-one -on -one and had had a lot of resources. And when the paradigm shift happened for communities of color and tribal communities, we hadn't had that same opportunity and advantage and I, I really feel like that is why we have not seen our prevalence rates go down as much. The general population had one-on-one -on -one tobacco cessation for years and saw a change, and then we did a paradigm shift. And that is strictly anecdotal. After all of my years in tobacco, I really believe that that's, that that's true. I think policy is a great thing, don't get me wrong, but I think we need to look at tobacco cessation and our cessation in our communities from what our needs are. Um, if we're gonna use the quit line, great, but we also need support at our tribal clinic. We need the nicotine replacement therapy. Um, we need that person to check in with because my, my lifetime experience with tobacco is the most important thing is that follow-up call of how are you doing? Um, if they've had something happen where they've relapsed to say, okay, that's okay, you know, get back on. It's th that, that to me is just so, so vital in tobacco cessation. Great, thank you, Carrie. We're coming up on the kind of end body. of the hour. And we just wanna thank you, Carrie, for um, being quickly able to um, uh, join the MCH ECHO and uh, provide this uh, presentation. I know you have a lot of things on your plate and you, and you uh, actually gave up another presentation to give this one. So we're, we're very thankful. Uh, and thankful for the uh, faculty that were here today and able to give uh, Namimi Puhal some feedback on their case. And uh, very thankful to Namimi Pu uh, folks for uh, meeting with us uh, last week and getting your case together and being able to present that today. Um, uh, I think it provided a really, um, a real in the field type of look uh, for folks to kind of precede uh, Carrie's presentation as well. And um, um, Allison will be providing additional feedback uh, to Mimi Poo uh, about the recommendations for their case. And if you could please, folks, thanks for joining us today. Make sure you fill out the evaluation form that Karuna put in the chat. It helps us to uh, you know, know what we're doing right, where we can make some changes, 
and uh, give us some more ideas about topics that you're interested in. So with that, Allison, did you have anything else to add before we sign off? Uh, no, I just, I think Carrie's uh, presentation brought up some more um, possibilities for recommendations for Julie's case. So I'm excited to include that um, in the recommendations, including I think having a support system um, around her and, uh, and doing it with someone. because so I think that's really powerful. Thanks. Okay, great. Uh, and if other folks are interested in presenting a case, please, please reach out to us. We'll be doing safe sleep, I believe, for December, uh, unless our feedback on the poll uh, shows that folks just aren't available for that particular topic. Um, so if you have a case and you'd like to talk about it, just reach out to Candace or I, and we can meet with you over the phone to help fill out that form and provide you some feedback uh, prior to the echo. So, hi, Shika CM, and we'll see you next month.